Father, let's pray. Oh, Father, as we're going to come to a very difficult passage now, a very sordid passage really, Father, we, we just pray that we will we'll turn our eyes to you. We pray that um, even in this difficult text, we may see the Lord Jesus Christ in it and you working out your eternal purposes. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I think the, the narrator of uh, the Genesis story catches us somewhat off guard in chapter 38. We had been expecting him to continue his account of the Joseph story, which we began in chapter 37 last week. And uh, the narrator leaves the story on something of a, of a cliffhanger at the end of chapter 37. Do you remember that Joseph had been sold to one of the most distinguished men in Egypt, to one Potiphar, the captain of the guard protecting Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. And we're left, aren't we? We're wanting to know what happens next to this young 17-year-old adolescent, this prodigiously gifted but arrogant teenager whose very existence had been held in the balance between life and death. Do you remember his brothers had overpowered him when he had come to visit them as they minded their father's lock at Dothan, some 64 miles away from home in Hebron. And overcome by hatred and jealousy for their brother, they had had in mind to kill him and throw Joseph into a nearby pit. Instead, they, they take the decision to sell him into slavery to some traveling Ishmaelite merchants on their way to do business in Egypt. And story, Joseph's story up to the end of chapter 37 then has been one of rise and fall. He's experienced this dramatic reversal of fortune. He'd been his father's favorite. He'd been dressed by his father as a prince in his coat of many colors, only to find himself at the end of the chapter, stripped of his famed coat and now a prisoner of foreigners. By the end of chapter 37, Joseph was no longer a, a free man. He was a belonging. He was a piece of chattel owned by one of the most important men in Egypt. But instead of continuing the story of Joseph, the narrator takes us on a detour and we look at a very unsavory event in the life of Judah, Jacob's fourth son by his first wife, Leah. Now you may wonder, as I did, what a, a story involving cruelty, deception and incest is doing in the Bible. Why did the narrator feel it necessary to include it? Why not carry simply on with the story of Joseph? But the Bible, as we will know by now, is full of surprises, and this is one of them. However, if we, if we take the Bible as a whole, Old and New Testaments, it will become apparent to us why the narrator was divinely inspired to include the story of Judah and Tamar. Now, I, I've uh, entitled this evening's sermon, Discapability? Is that the right word? Discapability? Discapability. <laughs> Deception and divine plan, the story of Judah and Tamar. And we come across, don't we, all three in this passage. We see God working out his plan of salvation despite the extremely messy, messy business of Judah's dysfunctional family and his own despicable behavior. And we're going to do so, go through the passage under four headings. And firstly, we see in verses 7 and 10... The sons who did evil, the sons who did evil. But Ur, uh, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Wow, that's a pretty terse statement. That's a pretty grim summary of Ur's life. He was born, he, was enga he engaged in evil, he provoked the Lord, he paid for his evil with his life. Now, we're not told the nature of the evil that Ur uh, committed. We can only surmise that the whole directory, directory of this young man's life was in rebellion to God. He did what he wanted to do without concern 
whatsoever if his actions hurt other people or transgress God's moral law. I wonder what appeared on Ur's tombstone if he had one. Perhaps something like this. What a waste of a precious life. His life was cut short because he sought to please himself rather than his creator. Well, next, the narrator sums up Judah's second son, Onan, in three verses. And Onan, too, met a premature end. What was the evil that he committed in the Lord's sight? Well, in, in the ancient world, there was this principle of Leverite marriage. It was the principle that a man should marry the widow of his deceased brother in order to have children with her, and then the offspring would perpetuate the family line of the dead brother. And we see this principle enunciated in the law of Moses, which Moses expounded to Israel before the people entered the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 25. We see it in practice in the, in the book of Ruth, where Boaz marries Ruth, the widow of the son of Boaz's relative Elimelech. We see that the Sadducees in the New Testament refer to this type of marriage in Mark 12 when they tried to catch Jesus out in a debate over whether there was a resurrection of the dead. At any rate, Judah commands his son Onan to fulfill his duty with his dead brother's wife Tamar, namely to sleep with her so that she could bear children in Ur's name. And Onan duly engaged in sex with his sister-in-law, but he won't father children with her. Onan enjoys the sensuality, but won't give Tamar what she so badly wants, children. I'll spare you all the gory details. The reason for Onan's cruel behavior, well, any baby conceived would not be classed as his, but as his dead brother's. He would have the responsibility of supporting the child but the child would not be seen as his but as his brothers and this was something that Onan was not prepared to contemplate he wanted the sex but not the responsibility and this was evil in the eyes of the Lord and Onan paid for his selfishness with his life what are we to make of these two cases Ur and Onan of the two brothers who did evil in the eyes of the Lord and then died at his hands, how are we to react? Well, I think there are perhaps two appropriate ways to react. I think firstly, with holy fear. It's a sobering reminder to us, isn't it? Our God is a holy God and willful sinfulness is a great offence to him. We know what he expects of us. We know what behaviour is right in his sight. And yet so often we do the very opposite. We indulge our sinful nature with its cravings. We gratify the desires of the flesh. We willfully do what pleases us and not what pleases him. So it's a, it's a sober reminder to, for us to fear him. We shouldn't play with sin. We shouldn't mess about with sin for fear of the consequences. But secondly, I, I think that we should react with thankful hearts this verse came into my mind from lamentations because of the lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail the 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 new king james version puts it like this through the lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not you and i have done much in our lives to provoke the Lord by our waywardness and our rebellion, but we have not been consumed. So we thank God for the gospel. We continually acknowledge that we are sinners, just as Ur and Onan were sinners, but we thank him constantly for Jesus, who died in the place of sinners. Ur and Onan then were the sons who did evil in the Lord's sight, and as a consequence, they were consumed by the Lord's righteous anger. But secondly, we, we see that the, the son-in-law whose behavior was despicable, verse 24. Judah said, bring her out 
and let her be burned to death. Judah's name appears some 15 times in chapter 38. He is the character driving events. And we've already come across Judah in chapter 37. He's the brother with the eye to business. He's the brother with an eye to a quick profit. And he suggests to his other brothers that they sell hopeless Joseph into slavery. Judah then has hardly endeared himself to us as readers. He was the brother, apparently without a heart. And of course, and this course of heartless behaviour continues into chapter 38. This chapter exposes that the full Monty of Judah's depravity. This, this chapter leaves nothing to the imagination concerning Judah's degeneracy. It leaves no stone unturned to reveal his decadence. And firstly, we see in verse 2, his willfulness, his willfulness. Judah would have known he was not to choose a wife from among the Canaanite women. They were pagans. They didn't worship the God who had revealed himself to this fledgling nation of Israel. Thus, Abraham went to, to great lengths to find a wife for Isaac from among his own people. In the same manner, Isaac commanded Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman, but to go to his relatives in Paddan Aram and find himself a wife there. But despite knowing Canaanite women were off limits as potential marriage partners, Judah went ahead and married one anyway. So Judah was willfully disobedient. But we also see his duplicity. He led his daughter-in-law Tamar to believe he was keeping his third son and youngest son Sheila for her to be her husband. All Tamar had to do was to wait. All Tamar had to be was patient until Sheila had grown up and was old enough to marry her. Then Judah would give Sheila to Tamar and he would father the children she so longed for. So he sends Tamar back to her father's home and tells her in verse 11 to wait. But Judah was being cruel. He was leading Tamar on. He had given her a false hope. He had no intention of giving his youngest son to her as her husband. He had Sheila, no doubt, earmarked for a younger woman. But Judah behaved callously. He had her bound legally so she could not marry anyone else while never intending to fulfill what he had promised to her. John Calvin, in his commentary, puts it succinctly. He kept one bound whom he intended to defraud. But Judah also succumbed to lustfulness after the death of his Canaanite wife. He thought he would engage in some no strings attached sex when he saw a woman he thought was a prostitute, little knowing, in fact, a veiled Tamar. It was a veiled Tamar, his daughter in law, disguising himself from her. When a man at their most vulnerable to sexual temptation. It's when they're away from home and away from their wives. That's when they're at their most vulnerable to temptation, just as Judah was. And Judah saw with his eyes like David after him, faithfully saw Bathsheba. Although the woman in question was veiled, Judah liked what he saw and he also saw the opportunity, and so he made an approach to her for sex. But Judah's greatest sin was his hypocrisy. When he hears in verse 24 that Tamar is pregnant by another man other than the son he had supposedly been keeping for her, Judah demands the severest form of justice. If Tamar had been guilty of prostitution, she should be put to death by burning, one of the cruelest methods of execution possible. But the level of Judah's hypocrisy is, is breathtaking. He's guilty of double standards. Not only had been, he been happy to use the services of a prostitute himself while condemning his daughter-in-law for prostitution, he had also kept Tamar dangling on the end of a piece of string. Mm -hmm. 
He'd not been prepared to be honest with her and confess he had never intended for her to marry Sheila. Instead, he kept her bound to a man she was never destined to marry. Actually, by condemning Tamar to death, Judah was rather conveniently solving himself a problem. With Tamar dead, Sheila would then be free to marry whom he wanted, and he would be free from the Leverite marriage principle. So Judah's hypocrisy was jaw-dropping. He was blind to his own sin while he took delight in castigating Tamar. And it's so true, isn't it, that our greatest faults are the ones we find most irritating in others. The sins which beset us, which are right under our nose, are the ones we take the greatest pleasure in denouncing in others who are also guilty of them. Judah's behaviour then was despicable. He was disobedient, he was deceitful, he was lustful, and he was hypocritical. The sons who did evil, the father-in-law whose behaviour was despicable, and thirdly we see, in verse 26, the widow who was vindicated. These are Judah's words. She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. You know, it's, it's Tamar who is the, the victim in this sordid tale. First, she had the misfortune to marry a man, Ur, who was consumed by evil. Next, Onan did not do right by, by her and paid for his mistreatment of her with his life. And then thirdly, Judah cruelly duped her. He made her a promise he never intended to keep. He put her under an obligation not to look for another husband while never intending to honour his promise of his last son to her. But Tamar was nobody's fool. She was not daft. Look at the, the, the last part of verse 14. For she saw that though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. She was like the one who gets wise to the person who invites you over to dinner sometime, in the knowledge that that vague invitation will never materialise into a definite invitation. And Tamar knew that she wasn't getting any younger. She knew her biological clock was ticking. She knew she would never be Sheila's wife. But Tamar was also no pushover. She was astute. She knew her father-in-law's sexual proclivities. And so she hatches what is, to us, a shocking plan for her own father-in-law to father her children. Obviously, to us, incest is never right. It's wrong, it's shameful. We know that from our studies in 1 Corinthians, that the Bible condemns it. But here's strangely, the, set, the, the text seems to vindicate Tamar's behaviour. The narrator appears to be in sympathy with her actions. Every last detail of her plan worked. She fools Judah into thinking she's a prostitute. She disguises her true identity from him. She realises that Judah is a slippery customer and is not to be trusted, so she asks for some surety she will be paid the goat he had promised her for her services. And she gets the ancient world equivalent of Judah's proof of identity. His seal, its cord and his staff. They are like Judah surrendering to her his passport, his driving license or his national insurance number. And these were more important to Tamar than the goat. His seal, its cord and Judah's staff would prove that he is the father of her child. They were her immunity from prosecution once Judah got wind Tamar was pregnant. So Tamar had every base covered. Tamar, in holding on to Judah's seal, cord and staff, had her trump card. And these are what she produced as irrefutable evidence to the paternity of her as of yet unborn child. And when Judah saw them, perhaps for the very first time in his life, 
he acknowledges his sin. He comes clean that he hadn't treated Tamar very well at all. In fact, he'd been a cad. He'd been a scoundrel. He'd been a rogue. He had behaved disgracefully towards her. When David's sin of adultery was exposed by Nathan the prophet, do you remember how he confessed his sin? I have sinned against the Lord. And Judah is also humbled. She is more righteous than I. What a terrible indictment of a covenant believer. A Canaanite woman, a woman with no spiritual heritage, had behaved more honourably than a so-called follower of Yahweh. You know, it's always chastening, isn't it, when a, a Christian's bad behaviour is exposed by someone of no particular faith. I have an unbelieving uncle, Uncle Len who would always rub salt into the wound if he got to hear of some one claiming to be a Christian who had got caught up in some kind of very public sin. And my uncle, I always remember, would always say with great irony, he is a Christian, isn't he? She does claim to be a Christian, doesn't she? But Tamar's vindication does not end with Judah's pronouncement that she was more righteous than he was. Not only did she have the baby she longed for, she has two, she has twins. She has twin boys, Perez and Zera. Her vindication then was complete. The sons who did evil, the, the, the father-in-law who behaved despicably, the widow who was vindicated, and lastly we see the God who was working his purposes out. We've been thinking recently about some so-called godless texts in Genesis. Chapters in the book of Genesis where the name of God doesn't appear at all. We've had examples of these in Genesis 34 and even last week in that very famous chapter 37. And we might have thought this sordid tale might have been another godless text. But of course, twice in the chapter, God comes on the scene to punish evil and Ur and Onan are put to death by him. But God is working out his purposes in several ways. And his purpose in this account of Judah, Tamar and his sons Ur, Onan and Shelah is to reveal his character. He is the God who opposes and punishes evil. He is the God of justice. He is the God who is moved by the plight of the vulnerable. He is the God whose anger is aroused by the exploitation of the disadvantaged. Judah may have been indifferent to Tamar's widowhood, but Yahweh the Lord wasn't. And he sees to it that the, the widow gets the justice she deserves, even though it comes about in a way we find shocking when Tamar gets pregnant by her own father-in-law. The, the law which the Lord gave to Moses at Sinai states this. Exodus 22, verses 22 to 24. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless, if you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows, and your children fatherless. And this is precisely what happened in Genesis 38. Although perhaps we are left wondering why Judah escaped the Lord's sword in view of his despicable behaviour. So God is working out his purposes in an immediate sense in this chapter. He reveals his character. He is the God of justice. Evil gets its comeuppance. He is the God of mercy. Tamar gets her baby sons. But God is also working out his broader purposes in this chapter. And with the birth of Perez, the family line to King David is established. Look at Ruth chapter 4. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Abinadab. Abinadab the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz. 
Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And of course, with the birth of Perez, the family life to Jesus, the Messiah, is also established. And the genealogy of Jesus at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel begins with these names. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Sarah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? The genealogy which begins with these names caught up in this family scandal ends up with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. If I'm honest, chapter 38 was a chapter I was tempted to skip. It seemed to have no relevance to the Joseph story, but it has great significance to the Jesus story. Perez, the son of Judah and Tamar, became the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. So chapter 38 takes the spotlight momentarily off Joseph and places it on his older brother Judah. It's not the most edifying text to expound. It's full of despicable and deceptive behavior. We read of the sons who did evil, the father-in-law who behaved despicably, but also heartwarmingly, if rather shockingly, we read of the widow who was vindicated and finally at the God who was working his purposes out. And this is our God. He is the God who can use sinful people and their sinful actions to achieve his purposes. He can use cruelty, lies, deception, lust, and even incest to work out his plan to save sinners. It was through this illicit union of Judah and Tamar which resulted in Perez that Jesus the friend of sinners was descended. I wonder too if this whole shameful business was the beginning of a work of grace in Judah. Heartless Judah was about to be the beneficiary of God's grace. God was interested in Judah, although up to this point, Judah had shown no interest in God at all. In recent years, there's been a series of uh, films entitled Despicable Me, Despicable Me. And I wonder if that was what Judah was effectively saying to himself in verse 26. Despicable Me. He'd been shamed. His despicable treatment of Tamar had been exposed. And for the first time in his life, he owned his sin. He acknowledged it and he repented of it because... Verse 26 ends with this statement, and he did not sleep with her again. He was disgusted by his own behavior, and so he disowned it. As we shall go on to see in the later chapters of Genesis, a noticeable change for the better becomes apparent in Judah. It would seem his shaming by Tamar was the catalyst for his repentance. How do you become a Christian? Well, it begins with the conviction of sin. It begins when you can say from the heart, despicable me. It begins when you realize you need a savior to wipe clean your slate of despicable sins and you can't be your own savior by leading a respectable life. You need a savior whose blood in the words of the hymn we're about to sing can make the foulest clean. And remarkably, this saviour was descended from one of the foulest of the sons of Jacob, Judah. Amen. <laughs>